Hello. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, just here to discuss a couple of bits and bobs. Um, let's see, where did I leave off last time? Just basically talking about briefly why um, ethics and morality interests me, my general sort of view on it. And yeah, when it comes to um, different areas, different fields of philosophy, different perspectives, so to speak. Yeah, ethics and morality kind of kind of has a bit of an interest to me, but it's not really something that I've been massively into. But like with, with many things in my life, I'm more sort of eclectic. I prefer to sort of jump around from topic to topic and look at different things. But ethics has never really gripped me massively for long periods of time. But yet a few things at the moment that are starting to kind of get me a bit more involved in it. Um, I was just having a thought today about uh, what we call it, um, AGI. Like the, the advent of um, artificial general intelligence, which is incredibly important in the field of ethics. Um, again, lot, a good many people might not know what kind of problems this could pose for us. But I'm sure you've already heard about, you know, AI and, um, you know, how we program it to be moral. And this, this is involved in the entire problem of what we've been talking about. It's like, how do we, if we struggle to define um, ourselves as individuals, as a society, you know, that how to live our lives, then how on earth are we going to train some artificial intelligence to do the same thing? And why this is particularly important, of course, is um, with the advent of AGI, if it does come to be, which it does seem, you know, does seem to be on the cards at the moment, maybe in two years, maybe in 10, maybe 20, but yeah, the compute, the compute power we have does seem to be there. And what it means is, you know, it's not a conscious, it's not going to be some conscious being. It's going to be a, basically an algorithm. But the algorithm will become so complex and so intelligent, well, artificial intelligence, that it's going to have, um, it's going to be beyond human understanding. We won't have the capacity to keep up with what it's doing or the lines and directions it's looking in, it's taking what it's doing. It will basically be out of our control. We'll be able to see the results, but we won't know, we won't know the inner workings of it any longer. It's just be too much for us to to comprehend. Or maybe not. Maybe there'll be other advances in the future. But either way, if this scenario does come to fruition, where we have AGI, um, whoever creates AGI first, will they win the race. They win everything, basically. But as soon as they get that, then the AGI will... It's basically you're, you're taking a huge boulder at the top of a hill and you're pushing it off. You can't stop it then. It's out of control. And this is where the, the ethics issue is really going to be so important. So what we what we play into the algorithm of what the paths that this AI goes, like if we, well, I think many people have read um, or at least heard of Isaac Asimov and iRobot. You know, the, 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 the three laws, what are they? Give me a second, let me just look. I can't actually recall what they are. Um, let me just check. Isaac Asimov Robot Laws. The three laws of robotics. Yeah, the first law... A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders will conflict with the first law. The third law, a robot must protect its own existence 
as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And, well, that is, that's basically Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. In science fiction, of course. But again, if, with these principles and what happens in a novel, as you may know, because they did make this into a movie with um, Will Smith and that. Yeah, the AI um, basically comes to the conclusion that human beings, they've got to protect human beings. And then it's like, oh, we've got to protect human beings from each other. So they kind of end up imprisoning human beings. And, yeah. <laughs> well, again, you, you can kind of see the snowball effect of, like, whatever... And considering that... Considering that what we... That we know that if this comes... If this comes to happen in the future, that we... We're going to be completely lost at sea. We will be out of control utterly. And the AGI will be in control. But we will... We still want to keep it under control. But the thing is... Whatever we tell it to do, it will be thinking... Well, not thinking. It will be processing the information in such a way... That we won't quite understand what's going on. And um, we won't be able to possibly reason okay, it's just literally it's like the um the singularity event they're talking about like a cognitive singularity event it's like um imagine us as three-year-olds wandering around um like like billion was it seven and a half billion eight billion three-year-olds wandering around on the planet and then suddenly you've got this overseer, omnipotent overseer, with the intelligence of, you know, all the combined intellects in the world. Again, how, how can you explain concepts like even like quantum quantum mechanics, quantum physics, um, logic, morality? How you can't really talk to these things in any kind of significant depth with a three-year-old or well, three-year-olds are smart there's, there's no denying that but they don't have the language the concepts available and <clears throat> from what my understanding is when an agi finally lifts off and just it's going to go a magnitude of order above itself again and again and again and create multiple copies of itself and etc etc <clears throat> so excuse me this whole kind of omnipotent hive mind using concepts and ideas and calculating possibilities, putting things into action to reach certain goals that we've set it, which we might not want them to do, but we don't, we just don't have insight into what's going on anymore. But again, that is if this happens. And if for no other reason, I actually noticed, um, I was looking on, um, um, is it Edinburgh? I think it's Edinburgh University, Cambridge University is looking into doing a master's there. And they actually had um, courses on, yeah, there's like um, artificial intelligence and ethics. I thought, well, yeah, we need to get on top of this shit. Real quick, I would say, just in case. Excuse me. Oof. Yeah, so it could be an issue, and that could be coming faster than anyone appreciates. But anyway, that's one reason why, because um, it's often... I do think it's it's really often important to let people know. Oh, can I change the size of this a bit? Wait, wait. No, I can't. All right. Yeah, I think it's really important to rather than just say, "Oh, yeah, let's talk about this shit." But why is it important? Is very often overlooked, and you will find um, in philosophy in general, there's a, there's a lot of ideas and concepts when you're just looking at the different parts of it and patterning your way through it oh this means that that means that this goes together blah 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 so what but when you understand the real world application or the possibilities of it or the implications that it could be pointing towards and when you have that sort of foresight a little bit more and uh, hindsight looking at the historical events that have gone on it can impact so many things 
well, obviously, like Marxism is one of them. Again, he's someone who's looked at the looked at um, the history of humanity through the lens of basically a class struggle, which is a view and got some nice ideas in there. But of course, he's not. It's not the be all and end all of everything. But yeah, the the morality. A lot of people just think it's you know, trying to be a good person kind of thing. And that's, yeah, my kind of premise of the whole, the whole kind of um, social sphere. The, um, you know, you hear about your know, virtual signaling, signaling now, but all, my point is, like I said before, is when we're talking about ethics and morality like I am now, I am virtue signaling. I am basically saying, look, I'm trying to do good things. But am I really saying what I'm saying? This is why I'm against the ethics and morality. But then the big question is, and how would how would we then, if if what I'm saying has some form of integrity, let's say, some kind of you know, I'm it's more right than wrong. How would we apply that in any way, shape, or form to um, AI? Because if, if we were to apply what I'm saying to AI, then it's basically, okay, do whatever you want, irrespective of the social implications. You know, don't don't be um, don't be shackled by how others may perceive you. And, but we don't need to do this for AI because it doesn't have a brain and it's not conscious. <laughs> it isn't a thing. It's it's literally an algorithm. It's a pattern of things. So it's we have to we have to take on the idea of something being right and something being wrong. Um, I, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with um, Kant, Immanuel Kant. It's all codger. 18th century guy. Was it? Yeah, 1781. Yeah, Critique of Pure Reason. Yeah, this one is a um, monstrous read, I would say that. But um, what he's he asked the question, what can we know? And and basically breaking it down to like, how do we have knowledge? What do we what do we know before we know, so to speak? And um, he he broke something. What I want to focus on here is he broke something down to what he called the intuitions um in a in a simplistic way it doesn't mean to be intuitive it's not that it's um the kantian intuition is basically like how do we have any kind of thought and he he reduced it down to time and space we and it doesn't have to be a physical time and a physical space again it's a, a mental space we we can compartmentalize different ideas I can't think of I can't think of a thing that doesn't exist in time. I can't think of a time that doesn't have relation to some kind of space. Like our our entire process of knowing anything is related to this idea of the physicality in um time and space. And you no, know, so that's the intuition. So um, a nice way um someone said to me once, and it's a nice way to um conceptualize it, I believe. Um think of these intuitions of time and space, that is basically the canvas upon which we appreciate the world. So we just, we, that is how we see that we cannot see anything that is outside of time and space, obviously. Well, when I say see, I mean, be, have any kind of knowledge or function of everything is relative to time and space to us, because that's what we are. But then the question is like, what about because ethics is not time and space. So then it's like, what intuitions can there be of like morality and how we should behave? Because that doesn't exist in the same sense. So it's like, um, it's what many people refer to as um, going right back to like Plato and Herschel and whoever, um, Hegel even, I believe. Um, certain 
I shouldn't say Hegel because I'm not really read enough of him yet. Um, but um, yeah, the essence being, you know, the, the pure, the pure form. So we can say like with our knowledge of the world, yeah, it's time and space. We can say, oh yeah, of course. Right? I can't think of anything that's not in time and space. If you try and do that, then well, nah. You can mention things, but there's always it's always related through your your sensory data, which is spatial temporal. You can you can't get away from that really. You can contemplate and talk of some atemporal place, but it's kind of you're doing it from a place of in relation to space and time that you know. So anyway, I'm rambling on a bit here, hence the title. Um So the, an essence in terms of like morality, what does that mean? It's like what do we base our morals on? And again, this is where I I would um I kind of think of this as being it's a it's a layer on top of the, the physical intuitions that um Cam's talking about, whatever it is, intuitions of like knowledge. Our moral is on top of that, much like the way our brains are constructed, which maybe that's why it seems like that, because um, I'm not sure if you know about this, but our um, our uh, primitive brain, um, corpus callosum, Jesus Christ, my brain, my brain's not working, and your cortex on top of it, again, you've got the, the primitive thing, your animal brain, let's call it, animalistic brain. And then on top of that, you've got your your cortex, and it seems to me it's, it's a very sort of similar thing going on as a as a metaphor, as an analogy rather. It's yeah, we have the time and space, we have our knowledge, we have our experience of the world here, and our morality is attached on top of this. So what is? But there isn't an, an essence that exists separate. I don't think there's a dualistic thing going on here. Well, there could be, but, you know. Yeah, dualism is something other. As, there will be something that's beyond science, so to speak. There will have to be some new meta methodology to bring that about. But anyway, we can speculating about things like that. Go a, could go a bit too far. So how do what do we base our morals on? And for me, it, it seems pretty pretty obvious. It's an it's an evolutionary thing for us. We are social creatures, which is the entire the entire function of like an ethic and a morality. It's like we we need to live together. We need to function. We have um we have sympathy. We look at other animals. We look at other humans. We see someone in pain. We feel the pain. The, the mirror neurons in our brain fire up. You see someone getting punched in the face, kicked in the balls. You, you, you inwardly wince because you are mapping your body onto their body. Because and you feel it. You don't feel the pain, but you understand. You can reflect it out. And this is where, um, when it comes to, you say a disembodied mind, which. AI to a degree is because it's not it has sensory input so to speak but again it's not even a, it's not even a mind it's just an algorithm and it's like how but how do we put how do we train an AI to understand how to behave in a moral way like they say the 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 road to hell is paved with good intentions and I think that's it's really problematic when it comes to AGI in the future. Very near future, possibly. So what can we do from this from this perspective? This very limited, stupid human brain perspective? I don't know. But maybe Maybe I am wrong. Maybe there is an essence to morality. There is a way we should behave. What should we do? There's a correct, there's a correct path through this forest. But 
if that is if that is our hope, then how the hell how the hell do we find it? How do we even set about this task to look and at least dismiss this line of inquiry? And I'm not too sure about that, really. But we can talk about... Hmm. Yeah, if we don't know what the right thing is to do, and there's a possibility we can never know, then we at least need to try and move towards what we believe is the right thing to do. Then there's the deeply relativistic argument of, well, maybe there is no such thing as something being right or wrong as well. And this is um, getting more into the, the realm of Nietzsche. And if it's just us humans, I don't, I don't really see a, much of a problem with it. I think we can just still feel our way, way around, figure things out, and go through the processes we need to go through. But if there is this, this AGI element that's coming into society within the next decade, that's, that's something we need to be really concerned about. Because things could go, things would go kind of bad. If you've got, if you've got um, a system in place, which is, you know, just trying to emphasize what, what this could mean for humanity. If we have a system in place, which is, it's basically the most, think of the most in, intelligent people on the planet. And and they are reproducing very, very quickly. They can work 24-7. They don't need to sleep. They're getting smarter and smarter all the time. They're not exactly hitting a ceiling. Their cognition, their ability to analyze data like instantaneously is amazing. They can project what's going to happen in the future. They can take all histor historical documents and analyze them all better than any single human expert on the planet now. So it's, you're going to have like, just think of like one single AGI in this sense. Like one, think of the, the most amazing expert on cooking, the most an amazing expert on writing novels, the, the best expert we have on um, neuroscience. This... AGI will be all of those. And we could just say, oh yeah, can you please solve all human problems? Is that a good enough thing to say? Because how do you how can you solve all human problems? Kill all humans. And then humans have no problems. That's one solution. That's not the kind of solution <laughs> that I would want. So this is where we've got to take extreme care. And just because something is has an extreme power, cognitive power, to process information, solve problems, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be solving the kind of problems we want it to solve. Or that the solutions are what what we would want. The solution could be our annihilation. And I've heard them sort of talking about um, AI, kind of like training a child to a certain degree. I'm sure I've all seen movies and read um, science fiction about this, but it's it's becoming a reality, which is kind of shocking. And I'm not being massively, well, I don't, I hope I'm not coming across as massively um, negative and pessimistic about the future, because I really do believe, I really do have faith in humanity for some bizarre reason. 
But I, I do think we can, we tend to, our stupidity is our savior. I've, I've always said this, well, not always, but for a goddamn long time. We do things which no sane, no sane creature, no, it, we do illogical things. It makes no sense. We make mistakes. We're messy. And very often through such mistakes and through trying to do the impossible things, we actually manage to do it. We, we find, we find a little crack and we open it up into a whole new world for ourselves. Just simple examples with um, like Fleming and penicillin. It's just an accident. Because if it followed, if it had been much more careful with his um, laboratory and it was super hyper clean, following the rule, you know, the rules of the time, so to speak, or even now, then maybe he'd never have discovered penicillin. It's the the sloppiness, the mistakes that make things like that happen. But uh, a guy that I really like, his lectures are amazing. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, like he went to, um, he's um. Uh, is it cognitive? Yeah, does studies into cognitive behavior, animal behavior, and he went to study baboons in Africa, stayed there for many years because he believed cortisol. What did he believe it was? It did now. Anyway, he believed that cortisol was key to something, and it turned out he was completely wrong. But because he just went there and looked, he found out many other things about cortisol, and it's opened up different ideas and blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, it's just... Just an innate curiosity that humans have is our is our benefit, and we will sometimes have an idea which turns out to be completely wrong. But stumbling through the mistakes leads to open doors we would never even thought of looking at or ever even considered existed before. Anyway, this is a full on ramble, but I don't want. I sort of thought about doing these talks in a way where I wanted to. Um, like you know, make notes and stuff, but no, I I like I like it to be a bit more genuine. But anyway, what else can I say now? I'll try and sort of tie this up in a conclusive manner. Then I check back and see if this is worth posting or not. But the whole AI thing, I guess we're gonna. That that is the means. That is a reason that a good reason for exploring this area. The other obvious good reason would be, well, do you want to be, do you want to have a nice life? Um, yeah, maybe it's worth thinking about why are you doing things? What are your reasons for doing them? What's going to be good for, good for you, bad for you? And okay, what's good for you and what's bad for you is, a, is necessarily projected onto everyone else as well. If you're having a good life, people around you will probably feed off that a little bit and it'll be good all around. Whereas if you're making mistakes and stumbling around chaotically, you might cause a mess and bring a lot of people down. But yeah, this is this is really digging deep back into the whole kind of Socratic question. How should we live our life? And I do think the answer is a whole plurality of different ideas and situations. What's good for one might not be good for another. But the more deeply intrinsic core of the issue here is like, you know, I want to have a good life. I want other people to have good lives. Like if other people have good lives and I have a good life, that, that's what makes my life good. Other people are good too. I don't want to be in a position where everyone's having a horrible life, but my life is good. Some people might want to be like that though. So, but I, I don't believe it's possible to have the best life when everyone around you is suffering. Unless you're extremely sadistic. And there are some people like that, of course. But for the overall... The overall good of people... The... 
the so-called average human, it does it does seem as it has seemed for probably every every society, every group throughout human history, that there is a better way to do things, that something is right or wrong. And um, yeah, the obvious obvious ones being things like yeah, killing someone is wrong. Because I wouldn't want someone to kill me. But, and then, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. Maybe there'd be a situation where I would want someone to kill me or I would want to die. Or maybe killing someone would prevent the death of a million innocent people. Well, you know, like suicide bomber kind of thing, that that kind of nonsense. So, yeah, but overall, in the general picture of things, killing another human being is not good. I think... Well, you would think that that is um, consistent throughout the entire age of humanity. But I very much doubt it is, because people will have the views in the past of, you know, the, the human sacrifice, like um, the, I think it's the Aztecs. Was it the Aztecs? Mayans or Aztecs? One of those, anyway. Where they would, um, there would be, it's probably likely, there's going to be the Aztecs most likely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So they would have, um, if you were born on a certain day of the year, then that meant that you were going to be sacrificed. They were going to kill you, human sacrifice. And this was perfectly acceptable then. It was an honor. People were like, oh yeah, great. It was a, it was a good thing. So then it's, it's considered good in their society. Um, even good for the person who's going to be sacrificed. They would consider it an honor. And for us, it sounds strange. Or if I explain it a little further, it does seem to make a bit more sense. Um, because this person would then be treated basically like a king. They would um, have, they would have um, whatever food they wanted, entertainment. You know, women. It would always be a guy, by the way, as far as I know. And you know, have, have women so they can, you know, lap a luxury kind of hedonistic lifestyle in a way. And then when they turned. Was it 20 years old, 19 years old or something? They would then be... And I'd willingly go up there. they would probably be drug-induced kind of ceremony, I imagine. But again, it's a whole... We can't... We, this is a the big problem where people talk about um, moral relativism. Yeah, in that society, it was perfectly fine and acceptable for this kind of thing to happen. Whereas today, for someone to suggest that... Again, maybe it's, it might seem quite reasonable to some. You never know. Considering what... Yeah, if you look on bloody, what is it now, like Switch, TikTok and all that kind of nonsense, Instagram, the kind of things that people do to themselves is quite horrific, especially women, Jesus. They're like um, mutilating themselves publicly in order to get some attention. And yeah, it, it to me, it seems utterly, utterly... Um, vacuous and empty and yeah immoral reprehensible so to speak but if that's what they want to do and you know it seems good to them well that's why they're doing it but if it seems i can i can see how how you can go down those lines and get taken in by that kind of thing and everyone likes a bit of attention likes to be listened to Hence me speaking here. Oh, actually, what I find by doing um, these talks, it's more about... It's more about... Um, I'm not focusing on... On... This. I'm focusing on... This. I'm, I'm trying to... Learn to... Speak in a reasonably linear constructive manner 
because it's it's a it's one of my goals i want to improve my ability to to speak um publicly to formulate my ideas better like when i'm writing i feel like i can write pretty well sometimes it just take a bit of editing but i can put together a damn solid piece of writing if i do say so myself <laughs> but um when it comes to when it comes to speaking i'm very like this <laughs> kind of hesitant but i do think um to be hesitant does help a bit but anyway um in in relation to the whole tiktokers thing it's curious it's really curious why people do this this is more kind of a a study of like a social study social sciences and anthropology human behavior because why people think they're doing it and why they're why they're actually doing it can be two quite different things you can see the monetary value of it but i saw something the other day where there's lots of um tiktokers that they're putting themselves into debt because they're trying to show themselves they're living like a rich lifestyle or trying to show off a rich lifestyle but really they're broke they're like in debt but they're just kind of addicted to the to the process more than the actual you know they're not doing it for the monetary gain clearly because they're they're putting themselves into debt doing it so what is the addiction what is the appeal is it just is it just for the fame to be noticed it's it's a really curious thing but yeah going slightly off track with that but again I, i'm i'm not I do stay clear of it. It says I said, what literally like two or three minutes ago. I find it morally reprehensible. But what I mean when I say that, it might sound much harsher than it is. I just don't. It's more about they're not. If someone's doing it, they're enjoying it, and they're getting money out of it. They're fulfilling their dreams, and their life is expanding, and they've got a nice circle of family you know everything's all good and they're doing this for charity or whatever then yeah fine fine yeah whatever I've, I've got no i'm not seeing the actual act of doing something going on tiktok and getting all these followers and stuff is morally reprehensible what i'm referring to is morally reprehensible is the 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 vacuous state where people are just kind of i guess it's a lack of the lack of um the lack of an ethical perspective on what's happening in their lives it's not there's, there's a lack of self-reflection or there's a there's a fear of really looking at yourself and thinking yeah is this good is this bad or not but there does seem to be my my original point here that i was going into there does seem to be some something intrinsic of reasonably i wouldn't say essence but something reasonably solid within the majority of humans where we can mold it and shape it into i i would i would absolutely not say like a a system for you know a laws or a plan follow these things and your life to be perfect i don't i don't believe in that at all i'd like not ideologic in that sense but there's got to be some let's say a methodology to analyze ideologies <laughs> a methodology to analyze the your ideological position and to and to um push yourself around a bit and see what see if you can orient orientate yourself towards some form of betterment whatever that may mean but that's a tricky one and it's it's absolutely i think it's absolutely true to say that a, a great many people who are who are someone who would be you would admire as in the way they conduct themselves in their lives yeah we got you know we make mistakes everyone makes mistakes other people they make mistakes and but people who we sort of look up, oh yeah, this is a, they're not, they're not like 
some kind of Christ figure, God figure, whatever you whatever you want to follow. They're not perfect. It's but they they have um they have a manner and a way about them where you can sort of look at them and think this person's this person's got something. They they they're good. They they got their shit together. Everyone appreciates them. They've got a you know, might, might not even have that much charisma, but they're leading their lives in what you would say is a, a good way. And a great many of these people, they don't even know. They just, it's just how they live. And um, this reminds me of something I was listening to recently. Um, oh, what's his name? Um, a British comedian, and he was talking about how he's watching this documentary about a woman who lived in Yorkshire and she had a life which was um, sounded pretty rough. Everything sort of went wrong for her and she just stayed in the same place. But she was just completely content with her life. And she, not content, she was happy. Like she, she, she sort of died a, died a virgin. Her family all died around her. She lived a very sort of simplistic life, very sort of rustic in a poor way. And, but she was just, very very nice i'm gonna have to watch this documentary and see what it was on about it's a guy from um eight out of ten cats what's an um does um countdown what's his name the kind of geeky one you can see his face but yeah he was talking about it on um some little podcast with um the, the guy he used to live with that other stand-up comic but yeah it was just interesting like to see that it's like a bit like yeah, diogenes if you know about him it's it's the kind of the purity and just just doing things as you do them without the thought and i think it could be something very much to do with what like you know the, the whole ego issue which you know all the buddies go on about as well but i think when people saying about oh you need to get rid of your ego i think if you're saying that then your ego is telling you that because you want to be better and i, I don't know it just seems a little bit contradictory to me it's like yeah the, sometimes it does seem to be that yeah the best way to achieve success or something the best way oh i have this goal i want to get to this goal the best way to get to it is not to try to get to it <laughs> but then like to then you all right so in order to get to it then i need not to try to get to it that's how i'm going to try to get to it and yeah, you're stuck in it. It's a contradictory position to be in. But it's kind of... It does seem to be very, very true in many aspects of life that i found, that I've experienced. It's like when you... You can sort of overthink things in a way. And if you just sort of lean into things and just go, all oh, right, or not even lean into things, just sort of let it go with the flow, so to speak. Things can turn out pretty peachy, surprisingly so. So it's a kind of um, taking your hands off the reins. And again, this does, this does, believe it or not, come full circle back to what I was talking about with the whole, my whole sort of view of the, of ethics and how it's unethical to be ethical, immoral to be moral. But the hypothetical for me is, um, you set up the foundation, you set up the skeleton, and then you just go in life and you live it. And maybe the foundations just crumble. You come back, you rework it. I didn't like what happened then. I didn't like the way I behaved. Things went wrong. Maybe I can rethink, how did it make me feel? Why did it make me feel this way? It's just, it's reflecting, going out in the world, falling over, getting up, coming back, rebuilding. And you're slowly building, building on the bones of your dead selves that have died off in the past. And I, I think that is, that is a, a reasonably logically sound, ethically sound way to progress, if there is such a thing as progression. But there's also the deep dangers within because, yeah, the, the ideologies can come and snap you up, and they will, and they do. You will have a thought, and it will drag you one way, and you'll forget where the main road is. 
Um, yeah, that is the that is the problem, isn't it? Forty-five minute ramble. Alrighty. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, so, what do I title this one? Ethics again, I think, isn't it? A bit more ethics. Brief look at the old AI, AGI thing. But yeah, if, if anyone has any thoughts and comments, I would really, really, really love to hear. Like, how are we... Well, if it comes to the point in this, again, another hypothetical situation, if it comes to the point where AGI is going to completely, you know, outperform all humans on the planet, massively so, then how do we set it up to have some kind of ethical or moral framework so that it doesn't destroy humans or make humans' lives worse in some way? Can it be done? And if it can't be done, what can be done to counteract the lack of the lack of ethics that an algorithm has? Pretty tough question. <laughs> yeah, if you've got any ideas, no matter how small or big they are. And if anyone does suggest that it's most ethical to kill all humans, then I don't quite understand that one. And there goes my alarm. All right. So that's that. Bye-bye.